So we have a return to the podcast of Elise Orsa. Hello, Elise. Hi there. Yeah, I'm great, thanks. Nice to be here. Yeah, well, you're where you are and I'm where I am, but you know what I mean. We're in the, in the collective space. Zoom space. Yes, yes. <laughs> yeah, in that sort of liminal space possessed by the, the, the Zoom gremlins. Mm. Okay, so um, for, for people who... who you know, ashamedly haven't heard any of the previous episodes, but just say who you are. Um, it was, see, last time you really, like, the, your first question is always, what do you do? Mm. And that's, it always throws people. And so this time I was like, I'm You're prepared. Prepped. I'm prepared. But that's but not I've, what you've asked me. No, no. <laughs> well, you know, you know, right. Um, yeah, so my name is Elise Orsa. I am a tarot reader, a tarot teacher. I have created my own tarot deck, the, um, the Blood and Ink Tarot, and I've got another one in the works coming. So, um, you know, this is answering what do I do? That's what I yes. do. <laughs> That's what I do. I'm also a visual artist, which has really come, come on um, yeah. kind of through the tarot practice as well. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's what I'm um, obviously that's what I'm particularly interested in is, is how um, creative processes actually change. Um, yeah. And I think, you know, because we sort of spoke about this before we sort of hit record and all that sort of stuff. So let's take it from I'm just trying to think of an, a natural sort of segue point. Maybe the, the, when you did the Blood and Ink Terror, the, the, mm. the major arcana. Yeah. Um, because that was sort of a bit, it seemed a bit unexpected, I, I think, from, from your perspective. Yeah, you it, it, yeah, it was, it was completely unexpected. Um, previously, I was not, you know, I was not doing much artwork, although I'd always been, um, you know, I've been creative and drawing and, and doodling and, and for everything since I was a kid. And when I was younger, I'd done a lot of painting and, and, but that kind of stuff had really, been um, put to the side for gosh maybe like close on 20 years or something mm. you know as adult life took took the shape it was taking um, so the deck did come about um, completely kind of completely out of the blue um, inspired by one of my teachers who was doing a deck at the same time and um, I kind of sat down one night and I put some I put some rails in for myself it's like some some guidelines I was like okay I'm gonna I'm gonna do a major arcana deck I've been working with the tarot for a really long time and it was already those those images were already um like embedded in my creative body and my creative mind if you know what I mean mm. and so the guides I put into myself was like you know each card is gonna I'm not gonna spend more than half an hour on each each piece of artwork and um, I'm go I've got had two two tubes of paint, <laughs> like a, a red and a black. So I was like, okay, it's red and black, and nothing else is going into it. And then I also chose to do that do it in the format of um, monotype, which meant that I was painting the images on a piece of glass and then pressing paper into the glass and making a print, um, oh. transferring what was in the glass onto the paper. So I knew I'd done that in the past. I knew that that resulted in some really interesting, um, unpredictable, um, quite fluid looking bits of work. And I also, it, for me though, it was more, it was more about getting out of my head and getting out of that part of my mind that would say, oh no, that, that's not good enough. You know, that would, that would second guess the work. So I was just really trying to trick myself just to be in flow with what I was producing and to accept it no matter what, really. Um, so that's what I did. And um, over the course of a weekend, like Friday, Saturday, Sunday, I ended up um, creating, uh, finishing the entire Major Arcana, 20, 22 cards, as, um, as some people will know, um, which was quite, uh, quite, quite a feat, <laughs> really. Yeah. 
and then the rest of the debt came within um that you know after the weekend finished i was back at work came within two weeks i finished the rest of the debt um but that has then you know the deck is now um is now published and is printed and is is um for sale and out there that has become kind of a catalyst for a lot of other artwork to mm -hmm. to come for come forth from that mm -hmm. um a bit like i opened kind of opened a creative channel with mm -hmm. that that really just refuses to be shut now mm -hmm. that's all of that is really interesting because there's a lot of little sort of threads there which is sort of you can sort of pick up on. I mean, the, the first thing is that having that, you know, you're using your painting on glass and then you're, mm. there's a sort of a, an element that you've got absolutely no control over. Yeah. You, yeah. Because um, I, I was thinking about the, the artwork where you, you know, you paint half a uh, piece of paper and then you turn it over and then squash the other bit and then you end up, with mm. this sort of, like symmetrical thing, because yeah. um, for, for moment, I can't remember which one it is, but one of uh, Peter Peter J. Carroll's books, it might be Lever Knoll, or uh -huh. I, I might, or I can't remember if it's that or Cows. Anyway, there's pictures like that in there, yeah. And of course, very weird, um, sort of strange, um, sort of I don't know, insect life type beings you know yeah. but obviously it's because you would you'd get that when you because you get these sort of symmetrical things that look like butterflies. yeah yeah and mine mine isn't symmetrical in that way because there was no there was no folding involved no. but no. i think it does have that that rorschach like quality to it you know you can yeah. kind of look into it and even i look and look and see different things in the cards all the time just because yeah. it's very you know the, the figures are very are very loose um, and very fluid and I find that other people use the deck as well they see things yeah, yeah. Um, that I've never even considered which yeah. is um, we, yeah I think that's just just phenomenal like for me there's no right or wrong way to yeah. um, to uh, use the deck or or to denote meaning to the cards um, I yeah it's also like part of that practice practice I know we talked about this on the first last time I was here but part of that that process of doing doing the tarot was, I was very very aware that it was coming from somewhere else. Like it was it was it's very much a channeled, a channeled deck, um, and that's remained part of the picture for um, for you know over the last what year year and a half two years now since um, since it was done, um, and so I really I approached that deck like the figures in that deck for me are are spirits and the deck is. Has a life to itself and and a system where it that that it inhabits with these spirits, um, and yeah, and I think that that's that's very much part of part of where I've gone where I've gone since then. Um, I've ended up doing it like the, my focus for my art has become printmaking, um, and that's what I've really I've done. Yeah, just loads, loads and loads of courses this year and um, time in the studio. And it's that thing where you were talking about, like, you know, the, I was pressing, pressing a piece of paper onto, onto the glass or onto a plate or, or in printmaking, we call it a matrix. And that moment when you lift the paper up, like you never know, you really never know what you're going to get. Um, mm. So I think printmakers, that's a bit of the magic it's a, it's a yes. dark art printmaking. It's a dark art, I have to say. But yes. it's always that moment, like when you lift the paper up, like what's it going to be? And everyone in the studio kind of, kind of you know, looks over and runs in and wants to see, no matter whether, whether it's complete crap and it's a failure or, or, it's, or it's wonderful. Like there's just that sense of wonder every mm. time, that, that moment when you actually see, see what you've created. Um, very different from drawing or painting where you know you have that direct that direct mark making control mm -hmm. um in print making you you make your mark so you create your image and then then you get the result after you've after you've run it through the press or run it through all of these mm -hmm. processes mm -hmm. um so it's a bit of a, a special a special obsession <laughs> right right so because there's something interesting in in that um that sort of process of, of having something random, like, you know, mm. spraying, like sprinkling paint on things. And, yeah. and then looking to see 
if you can see an image in there, yeah, and then working on, and uh, you know, I've done I've done an album cover like that once where it was just some random use of paint, and then then being able to pick out an image inside that and, and working with it. Yeah, I think it's the essence of scrying as well. Yeah. You know, going. I think going, so. I think it's a very similar sort of idea. Yeah, you know, go. It's some. It's it's that sort of thing is something that takes you, takes you out of that literal figurative approach to an mm. image, and um, really brings you into that imaginal space in your own your own psyche and your your interface with whatever whatever it is you're looking at. I've done scrying in water, like with herbs or oil or something, or you know, smoke smoke from incense um, um but, but never never spilt milk though. never spilt milk never, never scry over, over spilt milk, milk right? over spilt milk. <laughs> so I that in there. you need that on a t-shirt <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah and but, but i think that's that that's the thing with scrying because if you look you know you look too closely or, or you know in this you know, and you put a microscope over something mm. and your mind is trying too hard to grasp, then mm. you can't, you know, you can't, you really have to let go and just allow, allow the images come to you. Um, and I found that like that whole process is about building, like for the artist anyway, it's about building your, your visual, like your library of visual metaphors, your grammar, your grammar of metaphors that you have, you have to draw upon. Yes. Well, all of language is really a metaphor, isn't it? Interesting. But so, yeah. <laughs> you know, I, I mean, I think that's some of the things that we sort of we talk about mixing metaphors, but because we're always mixing metaphors. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah that's, so, when did you? I'm, I'm interested in that sort of thing about the way that things started to unfold. Mm -hmm. How quickly did you realize that this was happening, that you were going on a bit of a journey? Because obviously um, you created this deck, and of course you could sort of get to a point where you go, done that, that's done. Yeah. Now on to something completely different, you know. Yeah, so, so we created the deck in 2020, just before the pandemic. Um, and so, you know, that, that whole first year of lockdown was, um, I was kind of building my tarot community and building my tarot practice and all of that and getting the deck, the first edition of the deck out there. And then moving into like that, second year of lockdown I looked back and I saw like all these people were doing all of this cool art online you know mm. on zoom classes and all of that stuff yeah. and um I just felt like man I've missed a trick you know I'm gonna do this I'm gonna do this this year this the second lockdown I'm gonna do mm. some art and um god looking back now it feels like we were in that state forever ever doesn't it mm. um so I started doing um I started doing a couple of different courses, um, both of them related um, related to tarot. So I did a um, Active Visions of Tarot with um, Sonia McNally, who you've had on the show as well, who's just mm -hmm. a phenomenal, phenomenal yeah. artist. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So again, that you know that involved like going into this visionary state with the cards, which I'm very, very accustomed to. But um, this time it was someone else leading it, which was <laughs> quite refreshing. And um, and it combined that with you know with with creating with creating our own art over um, over a period of a few months. And then I went. I started um, another another period of study with um, in doing with Peter Duchemin doing his work, which is again combines tarot and art and has a daily scrying practice that goes with it and um working with some really really interesting um calendrics and really very very interesting interesting magic as well and it was really through that process that um having that daily like that daily practice devoted to image creation devoting to scrying and retrieving retrieving images and the framework of that that um that I found my focus with with my own art. Um, you know, we talked about we talked about the the cards as as spirits, um, and the, yeah, that's not that's not me. <laughs> that's not, I'm not I'm not the originator of that of that kind of approach to to the cards. Uh, Crowley writes about it. Mm -hmm. I thought Colquhoun, you know, writes about it um, writes about it as well. And you really get a sense of that in um, that wonderful tarot as color deck that she produced. Um, but for me, like I went, I went to this place where like the, my guides, my spirits weren't 
I was asking them, okay, so, you know, we, we've, I've done all of, all of this stuff over the last few years, what's next? And the only thing I get back from them is make art. That's it. Yes. Yes. <laughs> but, <you> see, I, <laughs> so I'm like, okay. <laughs> there's some really interesting things there because, I mean, you know, if people are listening to this from outside, you know, you think, oh, spirit's a car, you know, this card's got a spirit. Well, you know, if you come from an animistic point of view, everything's yeah. got a spirit. Right? So yeah. Uh, but it's that sort of thing about how things operate, isn't it, in, in the world? Mm. You know, how things, you know, and obviously those cards can operate as a doorway to ideas and, or whatever you want. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. So it doesn't take long. Again, think about metaphor and all the rest of it. It mm -hmm. doesn't take long, whichever way you think about the world, um, that an idea, whether you're thinking of it as um, um, sort of archetypal things, mm -hmm. as soon as you see something that's you know, the fall or something, yeah. Then as soon as you contemplate that, then the doorway is open up to that sort of way of what is a fool and who are they and yeah, who are yeah. the type of fools and, and and what does that represent and you know and and you, straight away you're down that rabbit hole. Yeah, and uh, also it's it the question of what is a spirit as yes. well. Um, yes. You know, I have my own way. I'm, I'm very open with the answers to that question. Some people will 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 understand a spirit to be, uh, you know, a disincarnated being of some mm. sort, perhaps a dead person or a ghost or something mm. like that. Other people will will see it as um, an imprint of your, of your mind, and mm. yeah, some exactly. people won't see it as anything. So, but just be triggered by that word, you know. Yeah. Um, and I think I think it's 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 all of that. It's all of that, mm. and 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 a lot more. And so for me, you know, if, if I think of, as you're saying, the fool, you know, we see images all the time, um, works of art or, or, you know, branding, billboard, billboard images, thing, you know, very, very familiar, familiar images that we recognize and that take on some kind of importance or resonance in ourselves. You know, let, let's say you remember the um, know, like a Sprite commercial from when you were a child and it happened to be at the same time, like your mother was feeding you your favorite food, you know? So maybe those colors, the, that imagery gets imprinted in your body physically and emotionally, you know, yes. as part of, part of this, this emotional electrical chemical matrix of who you are. And so then they, you know, forever after they, they take you back to that place in some way, even if you're not conscious of what it is, but there's like, there's an imprint of that. And well, so I that's, think, I yeah, think so. that's part, yeah, that's part of, that's part of what I mean by, by spirits. It's not the whole truth for me, but um, just, just trying to kind of make it accessible to, to people who might be a bit like, what, what is this, you know? Yeah, I think, you see, we've, because obviously we've devalued a lot of things about how we you know we use language you know we mm. sort of language maybe there's some people that are sort of working about how language needs to be sort of re well re-haunted really you know what i mean oh, nice. spirited because yeah. language is is one of those things that if you go back into an entomology of a word you can discover a lot about what it says that mm. you've forgotten mm -hmm. um and uh, you know where a word comes from yeah. And the basis of that word tells you more about this other word that sort of sprung from it, you know. Mm. And because um, I'm thinking of a couple of people like the, uh, Stephen Jenkinson, who's a Canadian writer, and he does a lot about etymologies of words and, and, and how, mm. you know, you can understand a lot about how we interpret the world. But, of course, the, the, the interesting thing, coming back to, like, the NLP perspective mm. of, stuff is that well it's about internal representation you know mm -hmm. when you you see something whatever that thing is it's your representation of it that makes yeah you know, and it, that thing could be something completely different but you can only see it as a particular thing because mm -hmm. that's how you see the world yeah uh, so when we come to the thing about spirits you know so i've always been fascinated by things like abductions you know yeah ufo abductions or whatever. yeah but of course, before UFOs, it was fairy abductions. Yeah, exactly. You know, in, yeah. in another culture, it would be gin, or it would yeah. be possession, or it would be something like that. But so the, the thing, whatever that thing is, is a thing. 
But mm. our interpretation of the thing will change culturally. Uh, you know, it will become something else. And we will see it and experience it as something yeah. else. Yeah, um, for sure, for sure. And I, and I think that's, that, you know, going back to the thing about spirits and stuff like that, I think, mm. you know, I think it's the easy, way, the easy way of dealing with that is, you know, just it's just whatever it is to you. Mm-hmm. whatever yeah. how it operates for you um yeah. and because uh, i think the same thing about songs obviously you know, yeah things. yeah and i i tend to i tend to look at um you know i do i do take largely an animist view of the world that like everything everything has a consciousness um mm-hmm. that that consciousness might not be exercised in the same way that my consciousness <laughs> or your consciousness is but everything holds holds a form and carries a function and and therein and that that organization between the two is is the is the consciousness mm. um so when we're looking you know when we're looking at images i think especially images that are that have a, a figurative um aspect to them like the tarot because they're all you know they're they're, they're people in particular postures doing particular things holding particular roles and, and hierarchies I think then those images have the um, have the capacity to um, over time and over over use and you know the gamification and the fact that it's a sequence of cards as well. All of these things make it um, very very powerful and kind of solidify that consciousness a bit yes, a yes, bit absolutely. more than say my yeah, table or yeah yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, and the, yeah, the, sequ- the, the sequential thing is a big thing for me because I think, you know, we, we, most of us experience time sequ- sequentially, you know, and we can, we can imagine that we're going back or we're going forward. There's, you know, uh, hour after hour after hour. And um, a lot of like my, my early um, interest in art came from comics and not really, I was never kind of obsessive fangirl. Oh, I've got to get the next episode of, you know, Spider-Man, what's it? <laughs> you know, but yeah. what I what I liked about it, it wasn't even about the stories. It was more like paying attention to how you know that you go from one frame to the next because they're all like there. There's certain there's certain uh, forms. There's certain ways that that comics follow, but a lot of them break that completely. Sometimes you're going, you know left to right sometimes you're going down left to right down and then right to left but somehow your eye knows to do that Mm -hmm. and somehow somehow sometimes you don't you get a little bit lost and you have to find it but what I was always interested in comics is is like yeah how we kind of instinctively navigate those those sequential frames and how the artist what what clues the artist uses uses to draw us from one one place to another Um, and then yeah, they're basically they're 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 creating time with those little yeah. boxes, basically, and they're creating worlds within you know within the whole storyline and the, and within that that whole book. Um, so that's that's kind of a similarity to tarot that makes me that that I applied on the tarot that then gets applied into creatively into my art and mm. really that's interesting interesting because who's again, doing what and where and where the eyes are looking. Yeah, and, because again, <laughs> if you think about a comic page, you know, comics. Yeah. Um, you've got these little boxes with pictures in. Of course, once you've got a spread of tarot cards, it's exactly, it's exactly the same, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. You've got this and it's that, and there's a relationship between this one and that one. Sometimes you're reading it that way, but then sometimes you see something really significant that runs in a different direction yeah. or whatever. Yeah. And because and, I was thinking about Alan Moore, so, so, you know, because obviously he's a grumpy old sod anyway, but yeah. I mean, very clever man. But he was saying about when he's, these, these books of his were taken and made into films like V for Fantastic. And, uh, and of course, he hated it. Because mm. his point was that the medium that it was written for was a comic. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and, and, of course, there are things you could do in a comic that you cannot do in a film. Yeah. And um, he was talking, because he, uh, he did this thing, um, for the BBC, well, it's one of these maestro things, a bit like mm. this masterclass. Thing. Oh yeah, I've seen it advertised. Yeah, yeah no, it's, it's actually really good. Yeah. Um, and he's talking about different techniques of writing. And of course, one of the things he says is that about um, uh, when you um, confuse a, a reader or, or, or send them, you know, send them in the wrong direction or something, mm. misdirect them. 
And he, and he said, and of course, sometimes when these things are, are done and they change a, a medium, it doesn't work. Mm. He said, one of the classic examples of this is in one particular book. He said uh, this about this guy who's an entertainer. And he says, right at the beginning, you know, first chapter, I think it is, um, he, he's doing his performance. And he said, some dummy, in, in quotes, some dummy in the audience shouts out something like that. Mm. And, and it's not until you get like halfway through the book, you realise that the, the, the dummy, the, the reference to a dummy is actually a dummy. Mm. It's, it's the ventriloquist's dummy. Oh. But you don't realise that. But of course, yeah. when they made the film, and the book was called Magic, and it's a very, yeah. very famous film it, yeah. you know it is about a dummy okay. which, because you don't get the misdirection yeah yeah and I thought you know it's a very interesting sort of thing about that you, when you you think about art and how it comes from a particular form not you know like yeah. say mm. you know printmaking or something that's got a particular genesis to it that, mm. that, that has a way of operating that maybe you can't you know you can't do that if you're doing watercolours, you don't get the big reveal, necessarily. Mm, yeah. Bang. Yeah. Um, and I thought it's interesting, this play is called a matrix of those. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a lot of interesting things, like in the, the tradition of, of printmaking. So printmakers have, um, they don't have a patron saint, they have a patron devil. Oh, which, do they? Um, yeah, 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 which is a Titi Vilas. So Titi Vilas is um is also also like the um the the demon of that makes people stutter. So the demon of typos and the demon of um oh, wow. of, you know when the preacher is preaching and can't get the words out of stuttering basically. So oh, wow. yeah, so you'll see in a lot of print um in a lot of print shops will be the great big you know beautiful Albion printing printing press um and on the top there'll be a little devil on the top oh, yeah. and so that's just to you know just to pay homage to um to Titi Vilas and um also you know traditionally the the um the little boy who was the kind of the runner at, at, to to do all of the really dirty jobs in the um in the print shop was called a printer's devil the apprentice was a printer's devil and you find like a lot of a lot of famous people throughout history were printer's devils when they were when they were young like Benjamin Franklin for in, for instance right. um and I think, you know, the essence, I say it's a dark art and it's not just because we're playing with acid and all kinds of combustible carcinogens and, and, and creating, creating these works of art, but it's also because it's about communication. You know, mm. this is like, you know, the inventing of the, of the printing press is, yes, is exactly. radical. You know, yes. this, is, this is how you know, the teaching of religion went from being yes. stained glass Reformation. windows yeah, yeah, yeah. to being words on the page, you know, yeah, to be, yeah. like this, this, this is, and then, you know, you think of every, every revolution since then that's happened. How did that happen? Because they were running off, you know, printing, they were able to replicate the message that had to get out to the people. Mm. Um, so we can do that even better now because we have the internet, right? Um, which is probably already also a dark art <laughs> yeah, exactly. but you don't get that moment with the big reveal no you know you don't get the big reveal so that like that that magic I think you can is only is only available in that that old technology and printmaking is a technology here's an interesting little twist here because I like the start of thing um in Lewis um Thomas Paine's house Ah. where he stayed, is a print shop. Oh, is it? Wow. Yeah. So it's like the other way around. Mm. Um, it's, yeah, it's quite a quirky little sort of print shop. So you sort of look at this and you think, because obviously, yeah, printing was, in, you know, obviously Martin Luther, was, that's that's how he was so effective. Yeah. You know, he, he, he was printing, well, hymns, actually. I think it was, it was a lot of um, hymns that he was producing that... that that got the world around. Mm. Um, yeah, so I think yeah, it's an interesting, interesting point, isn't it? And again, it's the, the whole thing of those the gods that d deal with writing. Yeah, are tricksters. Tricksters, exactly. Yeah, all... yeah, yeah. I mean, and are there any mistakes? You know, think of Freudian slips. How many times do you say the wrong word? But it actually turns out that you know there's a, a nugget of truth. Yes. That's, um, that's in there somehow. Yes. Um, and the same, you know, the same looking at, um, if we look at, go back, going back to the tarot, like looking at images as, as a language, looking at 
Mm. Um, looking at that sort of thing that you have so many times, there's an image that you know what it is, you recognize it, you've worked with that image, like, like the fool or the priestess or something, you could name everything on that card and then something else is going on on a particular day and you fixate on something that you swear you've never seen before. Yes, now that, I, I, that, is, that is true because again, you could look at that in lots of works of art. As yeah, well. yeah, and, exactly. You know, um, you could go back to a song. Mm. I, I, obviously there's a couple of, couple of artists that I can think of. I mean, particularly, obviously Hendrix for me is one of them because obviously he's a guitar player. I could return to a Jimi Hendrix song that I've heard and played and you know, over and over again. And yeah. I'll, I'll spot something I've never noticed. Yeah. It's like, uh, is it excuse me while I kiss this guy? Or no, no, excuse no, me no. while I kiss the sky? <laughs> what do you I'm need sure, it to sure be in the moment, really you know? Because I don't think he's particularly interested in them at all. Uh, the record doesn't sort of, No, it's, it's more like you get a type of, um, you know, sort of musical things that are being sort of slotted together. I mean, be the Beatles are really good. For this as well, but yeah. certain, certain aspects of you, you notice something that you've heard but not really picked up on, you know, yeah. and it sort of opens another doorway. Mm. Um, mm. But I'm pretty sure that's true with most inspired musicians, actually. And you know, maybe it's also a trait of the of the creative person. Yeah. Um, you know, the creative person is like listening with a creative mind. Is yeah. a very different thing from hearing, right? Yeah. Um, and I and I think there's like being in that creative space take takes us into this um, this more um, somatic, embodied, but open space. You know, you're out of you're out of mind space and into yes. yeah, yeah, into yeah, yeah, yeah. To body body spirit space, really. Because I think I think a lot of it is like this idea of curating something. Mm. You know, not you making it. It's like the thing is happening. But you're just operating something within that, you know, you're tidying this thing up or emphasizing yeah. that. Um, and I think what happens there is it's, it's, it's not just, it's not, as you say, it's not an intellectual process. Mm. And, and then it means that things are much more open. That, again, you know, this is why you know, I use things like cut up when I teach people mm. or when I create stuff, I, I, I use that a lot. And, yeah. and I was talking to um, Alkistus. Mm. And she was saying about, you know, books, things sort of in, in, the, in her library. Yeah, I listened to that. I like that bit. Yeah. yeah that, what that, book is calling me at the moment? Calling me, that's right. And of course, yeah. when, you know, I was mentioning that Cut Up is such a great, because it's the same thing, it's good Nancy, really. Yeah. Um, that you, you, you make sense of something that's been presented to you. Mm. You haven't sat down and worked it out. You know, that's a very sort of, yeah. it's a different side of the brain if you want to look at that. Yeah. It's a different process completely. So, yeah, so, yeah, going back to the thing about what you said about the printing, you know, you may have an idea, but until, as you say, you get the, you actually see the thing, it's like, oh, right. Yeah. Not quite. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, there's a lot of, I mean, you obviously you have to learn a lot of techniques for, um, yeah, for getting around that. And so it's also, it's very, it's a very controlled uh, medium as well in that sense. But there's still, you know, there's still that moment where you don't know, like, yeah, exactly. uh, did I shove it a little bit while I was, like, <laughs> you know, did I touch it the wrong way? Did it, you know, was it, was it in the acid too long or not, not enough? And oh shit, back to the, back to the drawing board, got to do it again. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of a lot of that like mistakes and repetition and compensating for for mistakes it's a very can be a very slow slow mindful process um, and I think you really like you really have to get it's a practice of non-attachment as well yeah. like yeah it really it really is experimentation and non-attachment yeah that's an interesting thing that because I think that's um, I've got a I've got a summer school that I'm running shortly where I get a load of people playing in bands who've never played in bands. Mm. Um, well, it's been a limited experience often. And it's that sort of thing of trying to get them to not think just from themselves. Yeah. Very difficult yeah. thing for to do. Yeah. And it's, they have to sort of detach themselves from what mm. it is that they think they're doing. 
Mm-hmm. Um, and then obviously, obviously, you understand from a musical perspective yeah. about the collective thing because you can't you can't control the collective thing. No, it's sort of controlling you. It's like yeah. a reverse, and um, so as you say, like a non-attachment. Yeah. To the process, yeah. you know. But you say that to people, <laughs> it's so difficult for people to get their head around. It is, and I, I, I have to put in um, little rules. Like I was saying, I have to put in little rules to kind of to trick my brain out mm. of, you know, out of being its own worst enemy. So I have to say, you know, like, this is this is the practice for this amount of time. The practice is drawing for an hour. The, and the draw, you know, the practice is making marks on the paper wherever my pencil wants to go. Just, just, just mm. following that, um, no matter what it looks like. Um, or the practices, I like one of the things I quite often do is I find um, I find like myself in landscapes, like working, working with landscapes, energies of landscapes through the art. And so um, I quite often I'll do a series over, you know, a week, month, 100 days I did for um, for Dartmoor of every night, every day, creating a bit of, of work just um, just in response to what I've encountered in the landscape it's a matter of just being in relationship with it and um it's just as much sometimes it's just as much about as about like the physical movements of creating the art as it is actually what turns up on on the page uh, uh, you know what what becomes the final the final output so in that in in that sense then the creative that creative process i think is much more kind of energy work, spirit work, psychic work, even it's stuff that's just kind of playing out beyond conscious for me, consciousness for me through the patterns and the movements and the colors that, that I'm creating on the page. Um, and so that's a very, where were we going with that? I was trying to respond to something. No, I, 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 with I'm that. Just, just, yeah, well, no, that's what, what you're saying. It's absolutely, yeah. absolutely spot on. I mean, you know this this idea that people have about creating. Mm. If you're not creative, it's a bit like when you watch a TV program about somebody who just happens to be a musician and they're going to be doing something in a studio, mm. and it's the sort of nonsense that you look at. If you're a musician, you go like, "Well, it doesn't work." Like that. You know, that's not the type of studio that most people are in. Yeah, some sort yeah. of dive somewhere, with, you know, the back of an alley. Yeah. <laughs> Um, but it's people have got a perception about creative processes like that you're thinking about it Mm. you know or that you're concentrating a lot well you might be concentrating but not in the way that they think that you yeah um or they might have an idea but that everything you do is wonderful because you're you're so talented and you're not you're not a human being yeah yes (laughs) you don't yeah and of course one of the one of those things is is the thing about practice and you're saying about daily practice Mm. Mm. It's one of the most, I think, one of the most important things you can tell to somebody is if you do something and you do it every day, yeah, you're going to be get you're going to become really good. Yeah. It literally is as simple as that. Yeah. Just keep doing the thing. And then you'll find yourself through that process. Because yeah. although we've been saying there's this sort of weirdness about it where these ideas sort of seem to pitch up from nowhere, but actually. It's about, it is about your involvement in that thing. Yeah, exactly. You've got to turn up. You've got to turn up and be present and be present with creativity. And, you know, you can tell it to come back later at a more convenient time. Mm -hmm. But you, if you say that day after day after day, this, then there's never a convenient time. You have to, you have to provide the space for the, for the creativity to manifest. That's right. Um, And that, what'd you say? I think it was Picasso's point of view about inspiration. Mm. you know um she does turn up but she wants to find you busy yeah <laughs> you know in other words you've got to yeah. work you've got to, you've yeah. got to be sitting there and then you can be inspired you know and i think yeah. that's so yeah i'm thinking of like um so louise bourgeois had an exhibition uh recently at the hayward gallery in london and i didn't know much about her you know, I knew who she was, I knew, uh, you know, the spider and <laughs> a few other things, but I didn't know much about her work before I went. And um, the week, the week that I went to see it, we, um, in my tarot work, we were coincidentally in 
the week of the hanged man um so that you know that was there we go I go in to see the Lu Louise Bourgeois exhibition everything in there is like you know bodies and clothing hanging from structures legs hanging over the doorway and um all you know this is this turns out to be um as I know now obviously it's a motif that she played with but I didn't know going in so it was like it ended up being quite a um you know like like an, an awakening into that because I I had this this you know, the, this framework okay this is the hanged man week and I walk in and I encounter all these hanged people in this space and so that then allowed kind of this access into her work in a really you know very emotional way actually I found I found the exhibition very emotional and then started playing out in my own artwork as well just riffing riffing on off of that and um I now, you know, I now know this is this is this is part of the research pro process for creatives, isn't it? You know, like you're you're in a space, something sparks a synchronicity or a resonance, and you run with it and see where it takes you. You don't run with it with the the idea that you've got this final output that you're going to create a painting or create a piece of music and it's going to look like this. You just run with it and see where it goes. Mm -hmm. And so I think for a lot of people. Um, they get intimidated by calling themselves an artist or by being feeling they aren't good enough to be creative. And it's, you know, that's, that's what it is. It's just, it's just responding, you know, it's just responding. And the, then artists do bad art. <laughs> I think you know, we need to be, we need to be allowed to create really, really bad art and not have it be a, um, a, a reflection on on our our identity as as creatives because the bad stuff is still is still turning up it's still engaging with that creative force um just as much as the good stuff is just the good stuff maybe with a hit <laughs> yeah yeah because there are lots of examples of in 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 the music world of of people's who's their their sort of breakthrough piece of music or their or their most successful piece of music, they didn't like. Mm. They didn't think it was very good. And it was somebody else who came along and went, no, that's, that's really good. I like yeah. it. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. But yeah, there's loads of, you know, Rock Sound by The Police is one of them. Yeah. You know, um, Just The Way You Are by Billy Joel. Mm. It, the band thought it was rubbish. Um, and it was Linda Ronstadt. Said now this fantastic piece, mm. you know, you know, and, and and so it goes on. There's like Santana's Samba Party, you know. They, they, you sort of think, well, so often the, the artist is not aware, yeah, and you know, and 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 obviously contrary to that, probably the artist's got some pieces of music or pieces of artwork that they think are really good that nobody likes. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, I think ultimately we're not the best judges of ourselves. <laughs> no, and, and also, again, a lot of why people like something is contextual, isn't it? It's cultural. Mm -hmm. And uh, as things change, then sometimes, you know, a piece of art, a piece of work or a bit of writing or something like that becomes, like, recognised as being incredibly amazing. But yeah. in, their, in their time, it wasn't. Yeah. And I think it's, isn't it interesting that like we're talking about um, how the, how an artist sees their work and how other people see their work, because this is always in the equation. You're, you're creating something that you know is what you, you can surmise is going to be witnessed by someone else or might be witnessed by someone else. So it, it's a process of making, you know, making something that was inside you vulnerable and visible to someone else. Um, but of course it doesn't have to be, you know, there's plenty of artists like um, um, Hilda of Plinth who created all of this phenomenal art and then stuck it, you know, bequeathed it to her, her nephew after she died and it was stored in this huge basement. And she said, you know, it can't, no one can see this until I forget how long, 20, 50 years after, after my death because the world isn't ready for it yet. And um, I think, you know, for the nephew, if you were a young man inheriting all this, I mean, my God, what a burden. Yeah. <laughs> you know? What a, oh my God. Yes. You know, you just got to sit on this stuff for like for 50 years. It's amazing. That he's yeah. It's, it's amazing. He did it right. 
and then now now the work is being you know has been released and, and is is being shown um finally and maybe maybe the world maybe the world is ready for it but you know she she created again with you know with the understanding of how it might be received by the viewer but with the caveat it's not going to be seen while I'm alive so mm-hmm. in essence she didn't she didn't really have to face no. what she did actually in her life she did face face yeah, yeah, criticism yeah, but... and all of that but yeah for um you know she both didn't get the credit that she deserved but she also she also didn't have to mediate that that interface with how how the art was received Mm, mm. Yeah, it's interesting that, isn't it? Because there's lots of cases of that. I'm just even thinking about Jung and, you know, the Red Book and the Black Book where, mm. you know, we're not, that's not to be published. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, it took, took all that time to get those books out. Um, but again, it is a problem, isn't it, doing art? Because you always feel that it's difficult to sort of be able to separate yourself from your work in such a way that it doesn't matter, that you can just release it and let it go. Yeah, yeah. You can see why people write under pen names. And... Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I understand that. But I think in that moment of, of creation, you do, if you're really, really with it, you do separate yourself from yes. how, how it's going to be judged. You know, you're just with, you're with the thing, you're with the creative, creative force, you're with the thing that you're creating, um, the, the materials you're working with. Um, there's there's kind of a yeah like a oneness with it um not always but you know when it's really when it's really jamming mm. then there is mm. that's interesting isn't it uh, fascinating mm. so you've got what's the next bit that you're doing so we spoke about the process and the rest of it but what what's your what looks like is because you might not know i'm just <laughs> Um, yeah, they say make art. They say make art. So I'm continually continuing to make art. I've got um, another tarot deck that's coming. Um, I'm working on a series of prints that are um, uh, visually working like with some of the uh, the confessions of the Scottish Scottish witches. Oh so right, some, okay. um, a piece there <laughs> that's, that's that's in work, and um, then life-wise my the tarot tarot business keeps ticking over we've got courses coming up um and also a course coming up with my with the blood and ink in the summer so it's kind of you know Vic it's just kind of more more the same keep making mm. keep keep going mm. <laughs> yeah one of the things I was going to ask you um, yeah and because you said something and I, and I thought oh hang on um about just starting the whole thing about the tarot group and, mm. and what happened there? Because I don't, th- I don't know if anybody's actually asked you that. What gave you the idea? Of, of, oh, of, but, um, no, yeah, I th- yeah um, I'm sure I thought, I'm sure I'd spoken about this with you before, but have you? Um, maybe, but you know, it was lockdown. It was 2020. It was March March 2020, I was on my sofa with a lot of people unable to leave the house and feeling very isolated and, um, and you know, and really sinking into a dark place. And okay. um, you did mention that, but I want yeah. to put, I just want to go down a rabbit hole. <laughs> what did it feel like? What was the thing that made you go, that's what I'm going to do? Um, I, so March 2020, I had maybe a couple of weeks before had just finished the, the tarot deck and I was having talking to a lot of friends who I knew through other, well, not a lot, a few, um, who I knew through other tarot groups. Um, and especially, um, you know, we, we had a mutual friend, Moretta, who sadly, sadly passed away recently. So it was really like talking, you know, we were just checking in with each other every day, making sure we were okay. And I said, I, you know, I basically said, fuck it, this sucks. Do you want to just, you know, let's meet on Zoom tomorrow morning and have some coffee and, and read some cards. And she was like, yeah, 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 do it, do it. And if you do it, I'll, I'll come and why don't you invite the others? And so I just put a call out for, um, hey, do you guys want to come and have some coffee and read cards eight o'clock in the morning? 
and people did and then they did the next day and the next day and the next day and that was it really it just turned into this right incredible. that that is really good i just want to because there's something <laughs> about this i think is really important mm. it wasn't really planned you know no because i think that is one of the things that is fundamentally wrong with how we think about stuff about mm. we like to plan the thing out yeah i um i li- well, we, I, I lived in a little intentional community, right? Mm-hmm. Down in Sussex. And um, was it a yeah, <laughs> Well, it was Lawton. Lawton Lawton School. But it, it used to, now, l- listen to this. This is, you, you think, what could possibly go wrong here? It was an old um, national health set of buildings. Mm-hmm. You know, a sprawling buildings for nurses and nurses. And of course it was a mental home. Yeah. Um, and of course it dated back to a period of time, but of course they were doing electric shock treatment mm. with people. So you could imagine the vibe in this place. The community centre was a treatment place. Mm. And I can tell you, people were having nightmares, other people moved there, lots of people, you know, the children were mentally ill. Lots of, you know, beyond the normal scale of things, you know, all manner of problems. And you looked at, I looked at that and thought, mm, you know, it's not particularly good. But anyway, sorry, I wasn't, there wasn't that bit. I was looking yeah. There was a fact it was an intentional community. Mm. People had gone there in order to get this thing happening. Yeah. And of course, the problem is that people bring their stuff with them, obviously. Mm-hmm. Not to, I'm not saying furniture, I'm just talking about well, mental furniture. Yeah. And, and the big problem, and there were some lovely people there, not, not to cry in that, you know. Um, but everybody has their own idea of utopia. Because com- communities never form that. Like they yeah, form by accident. They form yeah. that this person pitches up and, you know, and you then become dependent on one another for your own yeah. survival. That's yeah. how places develop. Yeah. And I think you're saying about that is very, very similar to that sort of thing. It wasn't planned. Mm-mm. But you needed to do that thing. Yeah. You needed to speak to somebody. Mm. And somebody else needed to speak to you. Yeah. And that was how it started. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. It was um yeah, just just like an organic, organic response and kind of a bit of, you know, a bit of a bolt out of the blue. Hey, why don't we do this thing? You know, yeah, do it at least. I'll come and invite the others, <laughs> you know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think it's quite a good term. Like, or just invite the others. Yeah, invite the other. Invite the well. Yeah, for me, it really it is invite the others. I'm I'm very um not that I'm selective, but I'm very um mindful about the kinds of people I like I have in my life. Like you know, I I cast a bit of magic a few like several a long time ago, way before any of this. But that was basically you know I have good people in my life. That's what it was. And I, I envisioned the type of people that I want as, as friends mm. and, and as just in my, in my community. And that was long before coffee and cards came mm. along. Mm. But it seems to have, you know, it seems to have become like this beacon that has really just shone, shone over my entire life. Yeah. Um, long may it. <laughs> yes, yeah, so keep, keep going with that one. Because yeah, yeah. You know, <laughs> If you think about the type of people that you could get, you know. No, exactly. And, you know, and <laughs> as you know, we don't have any of that in coffee and no, cards. No, we that, don't. Been, that has been a comment that's been made by a couple of people who yeah. involved in, in more sort of esoteric sort of things that you can yeah. start to set something up and then you have to leave it because it becomes... Toxic. A lot of them are. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah exactly. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> something. <laughs> And I can, I can, I can also think about what happens when you get a bunch of musicians together. You know. Yeah. 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 Um, <laughs> it can be just, yeah, pretty mm-hmm. horrendous. But um, yeah. Yeah. Cool. yeah no, right. we, we've got bring your own deck. You know, that's it. <laughs> yes. Don't bring anything else. Just your deck. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Well, that was brilliant. Yeah. Thank, thank you. I enjoyed that. that.
it's it's nice to know what you're doing because it's um, you know I think again that sort of thing about the creative stuff about where it takes you you know it's it's sort of taking you on a journey and you're not yeah you know you're not making the journey yourself well you are making the journey but it's not really. no it, yeah they just say make art so I'm just going to make art until they say exactly. something else yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. you sort of look at something you go oh my goodness yeah, yeah that works yeah. out that works well thank you very much yeah thank you Vic yeah. thanks thanks a lot. Yes. Yeah, yeah, and um, yeah. As I say, I, again, I've, I've got, I've, I've had a nice community of, of people for me to to chat to on this podcast. Yeah, you do. Maybe, so, maybe that's rubbing off on. <laughs> on, on so, you know, it's cool. For sure. Anyway, all, all the very best with what you do. Yeah, thank you. You too. See you then. <laughs>